So what I'm going to be talking about today, the enemy doesn't want me to talk about it. I came to know Jesus when I was four years old. I remember the day, and um, I'm 44 now, and over the past 40 years, I've seen a lot of things in the church, more than some of you and less than others of you. And this is something that I'm going to talk about today that I have seen that ravages the body of Christ. And I see it as a consistent pattern. And I invite the Holy Spirit to speak through me in any creative way he wants to. You have my whole body, Lord. There are people here today who are going to be seeing things that you probably don't want to see. But the Father is sitting next to you, helping you address things that you might not have otherwise wanted to address. And he does it because he's good. Our God is an offensive God. Our God is an offensive God. Our God is on the offense. He took action when we needed action. He went on the offense to confront darkness in us with his light. And so today, with his light, darkness will be leaving lives. In some of you, it has been there for decades. He is going to be exposing what the enemy has been doing in lives today. And he will be removing it from your life. And it will no longer be a pattern in your life today, I declare in Jesus' name. Because what God, where God exposes the enemy, he does it with his light. And his light is the life of men. And it shines in the darkness. And when that happens, things change. Because it's his light. So just know, the enemy is going to get offended today. How many of you have ever been offended at something someone else has done or said to you? Every hand. Come on. It does seem like a trip question, doesn't it? Is there ever a justification to be offended? Hold that question. Recently, someone came up to me in the last few months, and they confronted me about something that I didn't see. In love, they came to me and they said, this is what I see you doing. And it was a subtle thing. And as it turns out, it was some sort of, I think, religious residue or something from the past. I don't know what it was. But when this person came to me, um, it was just it, due to interact, how I was interacting with my son, actually. And um, they basically said, you need to give him some more freedom, essentially. Because I had fear enter my heart. And I thought he was disturbing people. And this person came to me and said, no. The father's pleased in what he sees 
in your son right now. And I didn't see it. But when, when, I, when the word was coming from that person to me, there was that, that offense, that offense, that offense to the offense that reared up in me. And in that moment, I had a choice to make. The same choice that Cain had to make. Do you remember Cain? God say, came to him and he warned him. And he said, Cain, sin wants to master you and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Right. And when someone comes to us and there's an offense brought, whether it's righteous or unrighteous, we have a choice to make. We can be offended back at them. Right. Or we can hear them out. And in that moment, what I did was, even though I felt the hurt of that offense, I realized that it wasn't meant to hurt me. Even though it was sharp, it was a scalpel to cut something out of me. There are javelins that the Saul's throw. And there are the scalpels that the Holy Spirit uses. And there is a big difference. And in that moment, what I did was this. I felt the prick of that. I wanted to be, I was tempted to be offended. But instead I said, I, I discerned that this person was right. And because they were right and, and, and truth is truth, I stopped and I closed my eyes right there as they were still talking. And I just closed my eyes and opened my hands. And I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do what you want. And that's not always our response. But I want that to be my response. And if he is saying it through someone else, it doesn't matter who that someone else is. If his spirit is saying something, if he is declaring truth to me that I didn't see otherwise, it's always out of a heart of love. So there are two types of offense. There is bad offense or demonic offense, and there is godly, good, divine offense. Right. Two types of offense, okay? Jesus spoke of the first kind that is demonic. And this kind of offense comes at the hands of someone sinning against you. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Matthew 18, verse 6. Jesus Say, says this, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. This type of offense that Jesus says is inevitable is evil. James chapter 3 verse 13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. So Jesus says, woe to the one from which offenses come. When we are sinned against, that is wrong, right? How did Jesus respond to being sinned against? 
When Jesus was offended, if you will, if, when offense came to him, how did he respond to those people? He died for them. Those people are us people. So even though Jesus had a just cause and a reason to be offended at how he was treated, he still was not offended. Even though it was righteous. And make no mistake, justice will be done, right? So Jesus is very clear that there is an evil offense, but there's also a good or divine offense that comes from Jesus coming against the sin in our lives. Romans 9.33, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So Paul writes in Romans 9.33 that God is the one who has purposefully laid a stone of offense among us. And that stone of offense is Jesus. Paul in Galatians 5 verse 1, or sorry, 5 verse 11. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. If people do not get offended at your preaching, you're not preaching the full gospel. Now, because we have a misunderstanding in our culture about what's right and wrong, let me restate. Offense is simply God going on the offense against the sin that's in our lives. He is confronting darkness with his scalpel so he can remove it. And so when someone comes to us or we hear something that offends us, that's true about us, the proper response is to say, yes, Lord, remove that, even though I feel the pain of what you're telling me. And it might not just be what someone says or what he says. It might be what someone does that offends you. For example, take Cain. Cain, Cain's brother Abel did nothing against him. He didn't lay a finger on him. He didn't say anything to him. He just brought a sacrifice that was genuinely a sacrifice to the Lord. And Cain saw that sacrifice and he was jealous. He said, you know what? I wish I would have brought that. And God's like, you have a choice to make, Cain. You can be offended. Because what was happening is when Abel, by his life, was offering a sacrifice to God that was well-pleasing, guess what that was doing? His actions were preaching to his brother of what was lacking in his brother's life. Abel didn't intend it to be that way, but God's truth stands. And we are, when we are confronted with it, the response is to be offended or jealous or whatever the case might be. But God is saying, I have a better way. So people were offended at Jesus wherever he went. People were offended at him. And this was purpo on purpose. Jesus came to bring a sword. Swords cut things. Out of love. If I knew you had cancer and I was a surgeon, and I knew that by cutting that cancer out of your body, it would remove it and bring healing and I didn't do it, would that be love? No. Assuming there's no anesthetics, would that cutting be painful? Yes, very painful. But would it be beneficial? Would it be good? Yes. Would it be out of love? Yes. Jesus offended a lot of people. Matthew 15, verse 8. Matthew 15, verse 8. This is an example 
Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees, says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Jesus is like, they're going to do what they want to do. And I'm going to let them fall into their pits. Because I have, Jesus says, I brought the offense. They've heard the word. And now the decision is up to them what they want to do with it. Jesus is like, I'm not going to enable their disobedience. I'm going to let them make a choice like I did with Adam and Eve, with Cain, and with every other created human being. He gives choices. He doesn't withhold, though, from speaking the hard word. Mm -hmm. I think we, in American culture, prefer to stay in the gray area because it's more comfortable. We can, anytime we we sense or discern that if we say something to someone, even it's the truth, if we get afraid to share something that's truthful and the Holy Spirit is leading us to say that, that is the enemy working to keep that person in chains. If you know that God is telling you to say something to someone, in love, of course, speak the truth in love, right? And then you you, you even think about doing it and you feel fear. You know that's the enemy. Yes, absolutely. Why were the Pharisees offended at what Jesus said? Did they have a valid reason to be offended? Did they have a valid reason when he would come and speak the truth for them to oppose him back? John 15, 25 says, But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. John 15, 25, there was 0% reason for anyone then, now, and forever to be offended at anything Jesus, is, Jesus says, offended to the point of pushing back against him. It's not, it's unrighteous, it's unfounded because he is truth, right? And so when we simply repeat his truth and someone goes, oh man, I don't like that, right? That is, that is literally saying no If we're speaking the truth in love and it's coming from the Holy Spirit and it's the truth and someone says, no, I don't want that. They're literally just saying no to God. Assuming we're saying what we should be, right? Being led by the Holy Spirit. Because God loves and in his love he removes what shouldn't be there. Peter talks also about this stone of offense a little bit differently. 1 Peter 2, verse 8, it says, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble. This is very telling. Why? Again, I'm going to ask the question, why would anyone be offended at what Jesus says and does? It says they stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But, but, verse 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I find it interesting that more often than not, We will get offended at petty things and gossip about someone rather than bring the offensive word of the truth of God to someone. Did you catch that? We hear the truth or or someone's life confronts the sin in our own life, which is why we get offended, by the way, in a bad way. All that is doing is just highlighting what's in our life. It's not, they're not the problem. We're the problem. 
if, there, if, if, if we're rece- hearing the truth of God and we get offended, he's just pinpointing what's in our life. And then what, we ha- what happens though, usually, right? We respond, we react and go, well, you, right? <laughs> when in reality, all that's happening is there's a light being shown on the darkness that's in our own heart. Yeah. And God's lovingly saying, I want to remove that so that you can walk in the light. But it is, it is interesting that, that I see more often, just again, spanning 40 years, I see more boldness, if I can use that word, boldness to rail on people who have offended us righteously about what's true then we do to speak the truth in love, the full gospel, because we're afraid to offend someone. You see both sides of the coin there. Because God wants to root the leaven out of the lump. The Bible says to remove the leaven from the lump. Proverbs 17, verse 9, practical wisdom. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. A rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. Hearts that are tender receive the seed of God. Hearts that are hard resist it. It's not any more complicated than that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a true friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Judas is the ultimate example of that. If someone always sings your praises, beware. If someone will never share a hard word with you, they're probably not your friend. If they never tell you, you have a booger in your nose. Something's up. I had coffee with a guy the other day, and he did that very thing. He goes, hey, I think there's something right there. Do you know what I said to him? I said, man, you're a true friend. So, guys, do I? Do I have any? I mean, now you're all, okay. Who's going to tell me if I do? <laughs> uh, yeah, if I got a piece of spinach in my teeth, you, you're going to have to tell me, or otherwise it's, it's just not going to be good. This is a picture of... The beauty of the body. I had a, a pastor from years ago. It always made me laugh. He said, man, if I had a tree limb growing out of my back, you would need to tell me because I couldn't see it. Right. Godly offense is God's way of rooting out all the ungodly offense that often lives in us. Godly offense is God's way of rooting out all the ungodly offense that often lives in us. It is offense that removes the offense. That's good. Whatever you want to do that is not of Him needs to change.
there is a way that seems right to a man. But the end is destruction. By saying, Lord, have your way. Regardless of what I think is the right way, Lord, have your way. Is the posture that we get to live in. It's the posture that moves us forward, not backward. And not on that hamster wheel we've been talking about. It's the posture that allows those limbs to get cut off and those arrows to get pulled out. The rough edges to get ground off. We need to allow the fear of man to die. We need to be okay saying no and hearing no. Fear should never, ever be a part of my reasoning process for whether or not I talk to someone or do something. Fear is not a part of the equation in God's kingdom. If there is even an inkling of fear in your decision-making process, the enemy is in the process. And he's not just in the process, he is pulling the strings. Right. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's right. I just really sense that the Father is wanting to go deep into our hearts today. Very, very, very deep. There, have, there are people here who have been offended and didn't even know it. And I, I declare, and, I, and I'm going to say something right now, over the next few days, God is going to be revealing to you specific areas where you hold a fence near to your heart and you didn't even know it. And I'm not excluded from that. Father, show us where are those areas, what are the familiar spirits that we are partnering with because that, this will tear the body of Christ apart. That's right. If we allow offense to fester, it will be a wedge between relationships. It will be a destroyer to the eyes of the world. It will destroy you and your closest relationships. If you do not master offense, it will master you. It will take you down, it will destroy you, it will rip you off, and it will take far more than you ever thought you wanted to give. An offense, let's just call out what it really is. It's unforgiveness. It's bitterness. It, it, it can't hide under any other terminology. When God confronts us, when he rebukes us, because it says all scripture is profitable for correction, for teaching, for rebuke, right. that the man or woman of God may be perfect, lacking nothing. Right. So we have lack because we have too much of the other thing. And God, when he removes something, he, it makes space to put something new in. Yeah. Yeah. AKA discouragement, sadness, Wreckage, when he removes that, he replaces it with the opposite. So what, what have you been holding on to that has offended you that God is saying let go of? Because he wants you to be whole and perfect. Someone could grab the lights. We're just going to take a few minutes here.
just listen to what he is saying. He holds the scalpel in his hand. Will you let it pierce you? Will you let it cut you? Because you trust his hand. You trust his steady hand to remove what shouldn't be there. The foreign object, he wants to remove it. He wants to remove that piece of shrapnel that has embedded itself in your body, in your heart. And a callus has grown around it. Protection. So instead of hiding it and protecting it, he wants to cut it out. He does not want that thing to metastasize. He wants to root it out. He's not done. He's just getting started. In the landscape of my life, you don't rush through any seas. You always take your time. A careful hand. A gentle guide You take what's dead away And you prune what's running wild So be the gardener of my heart Tend the soil of my soul Break up the fallow ground Cut back the overgrown And I won't shy away So what you want can stay And what you love can grow Through the winter I'm still alive What you've planted in is ever reaching to the light you prepare me for talking times you'll sustain what you have started and you'll teach me to abide so be the gardener of my heart turn the soil of my soul break up the fallow ground Cut back the overgrown And I won't shy away I will let the branches fall So what you want can stay And what you love can Oh, 
say I will give them what they need and anytime he is asking us to change fear comes in but he comes in stronger and I thank you right now Holy Spirit that you rush upon your people and you give us what we need Lord you give us the strength to say no to that thing to jettison to throw off the ship, that offense, to forgive that person, to walk, Lord, in upright purity before you, God. Thank you that you are the God of the breakthrough. 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 You, the of the breakthrough. you break through, Lord anything and everything that may stand in our way and we say today whatever stands in the way mountain be removed and thrown into the sea in Jesus name we lack nothing in him we lack nothing he gives us everything we need we thank you father we praise you we lack nothing every weapon Lord we need you've given to us Lord Every amount of strength and energy, Lord, we need you've given it to us, God. Everything that we thought we lacked, Lord, we actually have access to. 